bridges, not walls, how to talk to anyone about Jesus. As we get started here, a, a raising of hands, and I suppose that I, I imagine what the hands would be even if everybody doesn't participate here, but how many of you have found it difficult at times to transition into a conversation that you'd like to have, that you think you maybe could have, but you just find there's a bit of an obstacle there, there's a bit of a difficulty there to transition from sort of a normal, sort of a normal everyday conversation to a spiritual, it seems like the door is open, but you're, you're not sure you would do it right. Anybody here sort of feel like, man, I, I have a desire to do that, and I'm I just not sure I would do it correctly. Well, what I'm going to try to do today, and I love to see all those hands go up, what I'm going to try to do today is give you some tools right? Some practical tools. It's not going to be a how-to in in terms of a formulaic, when they say A, you say B, when they say C, you say D, and then finally they're baptized and become followers of Jesus. It's not going to be that. So there won't be this overly formulaic, but, but I'm going to give you some tools that I think you will find super helpful as to how to keep Jesus in a contextually and situationally and culturally appropriate way right at the center of these conversations that you might be having at university or at your local work or even with your neighbor over the fence, okay? So I'm going to set the, I'm going to give a bunch of illustrations at the end. I'm going to give you some sort of exhibit A, B, C, D. I've got six illustrations for you. But before we get there, I want to sort of set the the biblical theological background for why and how we should engage people who are not maybe exactly where we're at in our faith journey. Maybe they're not followers of Jesus, or maybe they're not members of your local church, or maybe they're not sure about any of this. They call themselves an agnostic. So how should we as followers of Jesus be guided in our conversations and interactions with those who don't share our faith commitments and our faith convictions. So there are a number of passages in Scripture that we're going to regard as guiding passages in today's presentation, and I'm just going to walk through a few of them. Some of these will be familiar to you, and and a couple will actually quote might not be. So the first one there is in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 20. This is Jesus' invitation to his disciples, in this case Peter, James, and John, and you'll remember this probably. When he's there walking on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, he invites them and he says, follow me and I will make you what? You remember this? Fishers of men, which raises the question. That's unusual language, right? That's, that's purposefully implying the language of fishing, which raises the question, why is Jesus using that analogy? Why is Jesus saying, follow me and I will make you fishers of men? Well, what's the obvious answer to that? Because he's speaking to a group of people that are fishermen in a fishing context. So he says, follow me. Hey, I'm going to tap in to something that you're already familiar with, something that you're already comfortable with. I'm going to speak your language. Follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Okay? A little bit later in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 8, we find Jesus encountering a Roman centurion. Now, this is a particularly fascinating one because the centurion who was not a Jew and who would have been uh, certainly on the fringes of first century Jewish society, they would have been, uh, there would have been many reasons for them to have regarded a Roman centurion with suspicion and even hatred, right? But this Roman centurion approaches Jesus and says, listen, I've got a servant in my house and he's very sick. And uh, I, I'm, I'm a man like you. I'm a man of authority. I tell people to go and they go and come and they come. And so, so could you please speak the word and my servant will be healed? Well, well, Jesus, when he hears this, he's like, wow, this is really extraordinary. He offers to go to the man's house. And the man says, no, no, I, again, I'm like you. I'm a man of authority. I tell people to go and they go and come and they come. So you can just say the word. And, and Jesus turns to those that were traveling with him. And he says, I, I, I have not seen so great a faith in all of Israel, right? He, he sees here the, the Roman centurion who was not a Jew. He was a Roman. He was a soldier. And he was a leader of soldiers. So there were layers of reasons for a Jewish person and certainly a Jewish rabbi to regard this man as, with suspicion. And he says, I've not seen faith like this in the whole of Israel. And now this is fascinating. Jesus then speaks the language of authority to this man, this Roman man who said he was himself a a man of authority, he says, go your way, your servant is healed. Jesus here enters into the world of the Roman centurion, affirms his faith, even though he wasn't a Jew, he, he, so far as we're aware, we don't know if he was a, what they called a God-fearer, but Jesus immediately builds a bridge, he speaks affirmingly, and he uses the language of authority, go, and your servant is healed with the Roman centurion. Very similar to what he did with the fishermen on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. 
A little bit later in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 19, Jesus, enc Jesus encounters a young man that we never really get to know the name of. It just says that a rich young ruler came to Jesus. And this rich young ruler comes to Jesus and, you know, a series of sort of questions, good master, what must I do that I may have eternal life? And this conversation sort of takes place. But here's the thing I want you to understand. When Jesus makes the invitation to the rich young ruler, listen carefully to what he says. He says, follow me and you will have treasure in heaven. Now, now, let's just sort of uh, analyze that from this very same perspective. He speaks the language of fishing to fishermen. He speaks the language of authority to a man, under author a man of authority. And here, when he's speaking to a wealthy man, to an investor, to an entrepreneurially minded person, he says, you are making a good investment if you follow me. He speaks the language of investment. He speaks the language of money. He speaks the language of wealth to somebody for whom that was their language. We move, we move from the Gospel of Matthew, we go to the Gospel of John, John chapter 4, a familiar story in the Gospel narratives, the Gospel accounts. Jesus finds himself in the fourth chap chapter of John sitting at a, on a, uh, at a well with a woman. The woman has clearly come to the well to get water. That's what you go to wells for. And when Jesus engages the woman in conversation, he says, I will give you water. So, so much so, it's such a quality of water, such a different kind of water, you will never thirst again. Well, she's, uh, she's surprised by this uh, uh, offer of, of water that leads to thirstlessness. And she says, uh, how can that be? You don't have anything to, to draw the water with. And Jesus then makes the analogy. He builds the bridge between what the woman was looking for and what he's offering, which is eternal life. So to fishermen, he speaks the language of fishing. To a centurion, he speaks the, the language of authority. To the rich young ruler, he speaks the language of wealth and investment and money. And to a Samaritan woman who's looking for for water, he speaks the language of water. He speaks the language of, of slaking a thirst, right? Not just a physical thirst, but a spiritual thirst. Now, there are other passages we can transition from Jesus as our sort of archetypal bridge builder, and we can go to the New Testament book of Acts, right? We find in Acts chapters 13 and 14, and I've actually preached on this very thing in this church several years ago when we did our series on Acts, but just quickly by way of reminder... In Acts chapter 13, right at the outset of Paul's missionary journeys to the larger Mediterranean world, in Acts chapter 13, we find Paul going into a city in Antioch, and the Bible says that he went into the synagogue. He went into a Jewish place of meeting. Now get this. It was on the Sabbath. Okay, so let's just fill all the blanks in here, and if we had time, we would go to Acts chapter 13, which we've already done in this local church. But here's the short story. Here's the Apostle Paul in a Jewish place of worship on a Jewish day of worship, the Sabbath. And so when he stands up to speak to the people there, he tells a Jewish story. He starts talking about Abraham and Saul and Samuel and David. Well, why is he telling a Jewish story on his way to the Messiah? Well, because he's in a Jewish context, in a Jewish setting, speaking to Jewish people. Now, what, what's fascinating is that in the very next chapter, Acts chapter 14, the Apostle Paul travels from Antioch to Lystra. And when Paul gets to Lystra, he doesn't go into a synagogue. And the, answer, the reason for that is quite simple. There wasn't a synagogue in Lystra. So Paul goes into the open-air market, right? And he begins to speak there in conversations with people about Jesus. And, and a really amazing thing happens. You know, there's a person that's healed, and I, I'm not going to go into all the details. But here's the point. When the people of Lystra begin to question Paul about who he is and what he's doing there and what he believes, he starts saying things like this. I bring you a message from the God who sends the rain. I bring you a message from the God who, who brings the harvests. I'm bringing you a message from the God that fills your bellies with food. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Why isn't he talking about David? Why isn't he talking about Samuel? Why isn't he talking about Abraham? Because these aren't Jewish people. They're not in a synagogue, and so he's not going to tell a Jewish story. What's Paul doing? Insofar as it's possible, Paul is taking the biblical story, the story of the coming of Messiah, and he's telling it in a, in a way that makes sense to the inhabitants of Lystra. He tells a Lyconian story to the people of Lystra, to the Lyconian people. We see the very same thing with Paul, this sort of MO, following, following very much in the footsteps of Jesus when we get to Acts chapter 17. We find Paul in Acts chapter 17 there on Mars Hill speaking to the leading men of Athens. And uh, you, you can actually go through there and itemize in Acts chapter 17 how many bridges Paul labors to build. He says things like this, men of Athens, I perceive that you are very religious. I was walking among your statues and I found one of your statues to the unknown God. I'm going to bring you a message from the unknown God, one of your own statues. I'm going to bring you a message. 
He says, as one of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Right? He, he's, he says things like, God has made from one blood every nation to dwell on the face of the earth. And he's not far from any of us if we will just reach out and grope for him. You can literally itemize in Paul's speech there, there to the Athenians in Acts 17, not less than seven purposeful, intentional bridges that he's trying to build to the Athenian people. He's quoting their poets. He's using their statues. He's affirming their religiosity. He's trying to build bridges, not walls, which is why the title of our presentation today is Bridges, Not Walls. We'll come back to that in just a little bit. Now, let me sort of read you. We get two cases in point of Paul's MO, his evangelistic MO how he conducted himself conversationally and contextually with those that were not members of his faith community, and sometimes, in the case, members that were members of his faith community, people that were, like the Jewish people. Paul's going to tell us here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, which I've put up there on the screen for you, I'm going to read it for you, so that we can have an insight into how Paul's mind worked evangelistically and conversationally, okay? So this is 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 19. Paul writes... He says, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. Now, let me just pause on that. What he's saying by, by the statement, I'm free from all men, is that I'm not bound by culture or by indebtedness or by nationality to any one group of people. He says, I make myself free from all. But then he says, I indebt myself, I indenture myself to anybody. And Why, Paul? Why would you do that? Why would you so adapt? Why would you be almost chameleon in your adaptation to other people's situations and circumstances? And he tells you in verse 19, so that I can win them. So that I can have an, an influence on them, not for myself, not because I'm selling a product, not because I'm selling a widget or advertising something, for the gospel. Now listen to verse 20. To the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win the Jews. To those who are as under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law, that is to say unbelievers, people without Torah, non-Jewish peoples, as without the law, that I might win those who are without the law. To the weak I become as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I might by all means save some. And then he tells us why in verse 23. I do this for the sake of the gospel. So notice what Paul is saying here. He says, I am willing, in fact, not only willing, I'm looking for opportunities to adapt myself to the local situation, the local culture, the local conversation, the local context, so that I can build bridges. Am I talking to a Jewish man? I'm going to tell a Jewish story. I, I can be Jewish with the best of them. Am I talking to somebody who's not a Jewish person? Well, then I'm going to have to suspend all of my Jewish language, my Jewish vernacular, my Jew not that I don't believe it anymore, but I've got to just, I can't bring that into the conversation because that's not their language. That's not their context. That's not their situation. So he says, I become all things to all people. Why, Paul? Why would you be so chameleonic in your, your addressing of various cultures? Oh, he says, because the gospel. Because the gospel, because of what Jesus has done. I mean, isn't the greatest adaptation in the history of the universe that the infinite, illimitable, eternal, spiritual God would become a man? Right? That's a condescension. That's an adaptation, right? So, so if the gospel tells us that God condescends to come into the world of, 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 of us, I just spoke about this this last week at TVAC, that, that the weirdest thing in all of, of the universe is that God became a man and took on a human name. Sp spoke to the young people about this at Tweed Valley Adventist College this week. So, so Paul says, if Jesus will do that, if God will do that, well, then I can situationally, conversationally, linguistically adapt myself. Am I in Athens? I'm going to tell an Athenian story, and I'm going to build bridges to the Athenians. Am I in Lystra? I'm going to tell a Lyconian story. Am I walking uh, like Jesus walked along the beach? I'm going to tell a story to fishermen or to investors or whatever. Paul here is simply walking in the footsteps of Jesus, who made the greatest accommodation when he became a man. So these are sort of our guiding passages. These are passages that get us heading in the right direction. And we can draw several just sort of simple and salient conclusions from these passages. Jesus and Paul are meeting people where they are, not where they aren't. Can the church say amen to that? Yeah, where are they? Okay, if they're here, we're going to meet them here. Right? The, the idea is not, hey, you should be over here, so I, I need to meet you where I think you need to be. And we'll come back to that in just a little bit. They spoke the language and entered the world of those that they were ministering to. This is key. 
They spoke the language. They entered the world of those that they were ministering to. Now, for those of us that gather here this morning as Seventh-day Adventists, and that's many of us, though not all of us, I want to give you several historical quotations to give you a feel for how one of the early founders and pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Ellen White, viewed how Seventh-day Adventists, who were a little peculiar, a little strange in some of their doctrinal beliefs and their peculiarities, how should we relate to people who do not share our peculiarities, our idiosyncratic beliefs, okay? And I'm going to share a few of these with you. In regard to making our faith known, no decided effort should be made to conceal it. That's good. That's good. Don't hide who you are. We don't see Jesus hiding who he was, but we see him being wise. We don't see Paul hiding who he was, but we see him being wise. Okay, explain. No effort should be made to conceal our faith, but no unwise effort should be put forth to make it prominent either. Fascinating. What a balance. Don't hide it, but don't put it right out front in an obnoxious way. She continues. Persons will come to the sanitarium, to the hospital, who are in a favorable condition to be impressed by the truth. Right? These are people that have come to us. These are opportunities, evangelistic conversational opportunities. How should we relate to these people that come into our sphere of influence? If they ask questions. Okay, I just want you to hear that again. If they ask questions, right? So notice where the initiative starts. It starts on their end, not on our end. If they ask questions in regard to our faith, it would be proper to state what we believe, say these words with me that I've underlined here, in a clear and simple manner. Let's say that together again. In a clear and simple manner. Indwelling godliness, that is to say the indwelling of the Spirit in the life of everybody that is surrendered to Jesus, imparts a power to the conduct of the true believer that gives him or her an influence for the right. You don't have to give a giant theological disquisition because the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you will make your clear, simple answer actually quite persuasive. But in this matter, we should act with discretion. There are conscientious persons who think it is their duty to talk freely upon points of faith on which there is a difference of opinion in a manner which arouses the combativeness of those with whom they converse. I know some of these people. Some of these people are in this room right now. They think, you know what? We have to tell the truth, and we have to give it to them straight. But notice what she says. When we unnecessarily arouse the combativeness of people, they turn off their ears, and now it becomes an argument, right? And I'll speak louder. No, 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 you'll speak louder. No, I'll speak louder. When Paul went to Athens, he could have given a very different kind of speech. Rather than saying, hey, I was walking among your statues and I saw one to the unknown God and I want to talk to you about your own poets and you're all very religious. He could have said, you're a bunch of polytheistic pagans who don't understand that idolatry is a, is a grave sin against yourselves and against the one true God, Yahweh. We could have done that. And he would have been telling the truth. But he would have been telling the truth in such a way so as to absolutely seal off any hope of being heard, and furthermore, he would have aroused the combativeness of his audience. Okay? Now notice, final one here. One such premature injudicious, injudicious effort may close the ears of one who would otherwise have heard patiently. You can close ears by the way you conduct yourself, but who will now influence others unfavorably. Through the indiscretion of one, the ears and hearts of many may be closed to the truth. So we have not only the example of Jesus, we have not only the example of Paul, but here we have one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church saying, hey, look, be careful how you register the most potentially combative or, 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 or unusual teachings of your faith, those idiosyncratic, peculiar things. Be careful how you register them. In 1905, she wrote, the same woman, Ellen White wrote, as we become interested in the salvation of souls, we cease to mind the what kind of differences? The little differences that so often arise in our association with one another. This is key. She says, man, when we're overcome with this, this sounds like Paul. To the weak, I become as weak. To the, to the Jew, I become as Jew. To those who are without the laws, without. Why, Paul? Why do you do that? Well, so I want to win. I want to win to the gospel. I want to win to Jesus. I'm looking for a point of access. When we're driven by the overarching narrative, how can we positively and favorably influence somebody toward Jesus, we will not be making a big deal about what she calls little differences, right? We, we're not compromising the truth in any particular to just tell the truth in a way that's wise. We find Jesus in the New, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, frequently being questioned point blank, are you the Messiah or not? 
And we very, very, very rarely find Jesus coming right out and say, okay, okay, let me level with you all. This is who I am, and this is why I'm here, and this is what's going to happen. Jesus spoke in parables. He spoke in stories. Even when he was asked point blank, are you the Messiah? His answer is a fascinating answer. He answers that with a question. I got a question for you. John the Baptist, when he was baptizing, was that of men or was that of God? So even when Jesus was put on the spot, he was reluctant because he knew that the people were ill-equipped to hear what he had to say. In a secular country like Australia or many areas of the United States or many areas of Europe, people are ill-equipped to hear what you have to say as a follower of Jesus. Am I telling the truth or not? So you have to be wise. You have to be intelligent. You have to be, as Jesus would say, wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. How you engage we're not talking about a diminishment of the truth. We're not talking about a compromising of the truth. We're talking about a contextualizing, linguistically, conversationally, situationally. How, how do we build bridges and not just walls? Let me just give you some examples of what this looks like. So the first half, we set the stage for why. Why do we do this? Well, for the gospel's sake. And because many of these idiosyncratic cultural elements, peculiar elements, are not in and of themselves the gospel, right? Right? There, there are things that are important to you, they're important to me, they might be important to followers of Jesus. No, nothing wrong with that, but we want to get to the major thing, and the major thing is Jesus. And I'm going to give you several examples. I'm going to talk to you about Ben, a local Baptist chaplain. I want to talk to you about my personal interaction and experience with Jehovah's Witnesses. I'll tell you the story of Suparna, the Hindu clinical psychologist that I met a few months ago. I'll tell you a, an older story that happened to me several years ago with Kifa Abdul Muhammad, a devout Muslim. I'll tell you the story of something that happened in this very community, in fact, in this very church, a conversation with a man named Joel, who was a genuine atheist. And I'll tell you the story of Kate, the Pentecostal minister. Now, before we get to those six stories, I need to introduce you to something that I've formulated. I've come up with this. So if you love it, great. You can give me all the credit. And if you hate it, just say, well, that's stupid and I don't like it. Okay? So this is, this is mine. And uh, it's been very helpful to me. And I hope it'll be similarly helpful to you. It's something I call the X to 10 fallacy, right? The X to 10 fallacy. And you can just imagine there, you've got, you know, numbers 1 to 10. And just imagine a continuum where 1 is no religiosity. You could even say hostile to religion, right? These are people that you meet that are either totally secular or they might be atheistic. So either ambivalent or indifferent or downright hostile. And then through the continuum all the way down to 10, you have baptized, spirit-filled, you know, church-attending follower of Jesus, right? That's 10. So anywhere along that continuum, everybody that you meet is going to fit somewhere on there, right? Let's say you meet somebody who was raised a Christian, but doesn't really, you know, now they've married somebody who's not a Christian. They're not really going to church now. And, you know, they're, they think Jesus is pretty cool, but Christianity doesn't form a major part of their life. Maybe there are three, right? Or maybe you meet somebody who's a devout follower of, of, of the Islamic faith. And so they're very religious, but they're certainly not religious in terms of a Christian view of religion. Maybe they fit somewhere around a six or a seven because they're very religious, they're very devout, but the Christian thing is a bit of a non-starter for them. Everybody that you meet is going to be somewhere on this continuum, right? Maybe you meet somebody who who's a, a loves Jesus and, and occasionally comes to church, and, but, but not so sure about certain aspects. Maybe they're a nine. Maybe they're just very close to coming across whatever 10 is. And I'm using 10 here is whatever your personal finish line is. I think for most of us that would look like baptized, church attending, active in church, that sort of a thing, right? So 10 is, is sort of the finish line, okay? So the X to 10 fallacy goes something like this. When people are moving in their various religious journeys along this continuum, the only really measurable metric of success, what we might call success, is when somebody's baptized, Right? When, when somebody's baptized and they become a follower of Jesus and they go under the water and they come up and they start regularly attending church, we say, yes, woo, that's great. And we celebrate it, and rightfully so. We've had some amazing baptisms take place in this church just in the last few months. It's been awesome what's been happening here. It's just so thrilling. But I want to tell you something. Ten is not the only place where success is seen and measurable. Okay? And that's what I want to talk to you about. The 10, a 10 is the most measurable, but not the only meaningful metric, metric of gospel success. Notice that I've modified the word success with the word gospel, gospel success. So gospel success might look something like this. Let's say you have a coworker or a friend or an associate who's not really super 
religious, they're open, they're interested. And one day, in a course, the course of a conversation, they ask you a question about something that's, you know, tangentially religious. And uh, you're able to bring up your own faith and how that's been really helpful to you. And you're a member of a local church that you feel really good about and you, you love the community there. And they then say something like this. Well, no, that's, that's interesting to hear how religion has helped you so much. I've never been a very religious person, but, but maybe someday I'll look into it. Okay, okay, beloved. That is not baptism. That's not surrendering to Jesus. That's not reading and studying their Bible or volunteering at a local church. We get that. But maybe they just transitioned from a three to a four, right? Maybe they just moved along that continuum. And here's what I want you to understand here today. If anybody moves in any particular, in any numerical value along this continuum of one to ten, that is success. It's not success that's measurable by a local church or by a pastor or by some metric on a spreadsheet, but heaven sees it as success. And so the X to 10 fallacy is this idea that you've not really had gospel success until somebody's baptized, until somebody becomes a member of a local... No. Oh, no. There can be all kinds of wonderful little incremental, fractional successes along the way. In fact, I'm going to tell you a story of my own experience where my own conversion... Was, was a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here. And I imagine for those of you that were not raised in the Christian context, in a Christian environment, yours is probably similar. You had a little something here that kind of got you thinking, and then a little something here, and maybe a bit of a roadblock or an obstacle, but then you overcame that. And all of a sudden, you're, you're maybe not to a 10 yet, but you're at a 7. You used to be at a 4. You used to be at a 3. You used to be at a 2. So I want to disabuse your mind of this idea that if you didn't bring somebody from wherever they were all the way to baptized member of your local church that you've somehow failed. No, 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 no. Any progress toward Jesus, any progress toward God is gospel success. Can somebody say amen? So you got to modify sort of how you view what success looks like, especially in ultra secular contexts like the one we find ourselves in here. We must learn to better understand and to better appreciate gospel success, which is any movement, fractional or otherwise, towards Jesus and towards God. We must learn to trust God with those less measurable metrics of gospel success, right? There's going to be some situations, say you have a neighbor for 10 years. Well, that's a long-term relationship. Maybe you have a client for 15 years. That's a long-term relationship, and they can see your honesty, and they can see your integrity, and they can see how you conduct your bit. Fine. But if, if you just get in an Uber car, right, you, you take an Uber or a taxi or something, or you're in a checkout line, or you're in another town, and you're getting your hair cut, in these sort of these short little interactions that are very likely not going to be repeated, you have to measure success differently. It's very unlikely you're going to get into an Uber car and at the end of the Uber ride be looking for, you know, water to baptize the person in, you know, hey, we need to find some water before you drop me off so I can quickly baptize you. So you're going to have to modify how you view success. How can you, if opportunity presents itself, positively influence this person for the gospel? How can you just make a favorable impression upon them for Christ? Okay? Changing, modifying the way that we view what success looks like. So let me just give you some examples of how this works. Shortly after my arrival here at the Kingscliff Church, I was hounded, and I don't think Carolyn would mind me saying you that. I was telling you that. I was hounded by, by one of our members, Carolyn. She said, oh, you have to come, you have to come, you have to come to my local school. You have to come, you have to come. It's a lovely school up the road, Hillcrest. Many of you are familiar with it. You have to come to my local school and, and speak. I've been telling my chaplain about you. And she was hounding me, and, and I would later find out she was hounding Ben on the other end. Oh, my God, the guy, we got the greatest pastor. He's so wonderful. He's great. You have to have him come and speak. And so, you know, God bless Carolyn. She is so enthusiastic. When she gets her mind set on something... It is going to happen, right? It's just, that's just the way it is if you know Carolyn. So anyway, it eventually works out, and uh, I go up there and meet Ben, and he's a lovely guy, and, and uh, he's the chaplain there of the, the large school, Hillcrest, and, and uh, we hit it right off. And I give a staff devotion, goes great. He says to me, oh, hey, I'm so sorry to do this to you, but we've had a cancel cancellation. C could, could I sneak you in in five weeks' time? Because I had somebody, yeah, of course, I'm happy to sneak in. So I went and I did a second staff worship. Went really well. He then says, hey, I, you know, after he'd sort of sussed me out and saw, yeah, I can trust this guy, would you come and speak to the students? So I went and I did a chapel for the younger students, then later a chapel for the older students, and then on one day a chapel for both students. So, so Ben and I, over the course of about eight months to a year, are developing a relationship, right? I'm, Ben's a follower of Jesus. I'm develop, developing a relationship with him. So he comes to me one day, in fact, the, the, the last time I saw him after, uh, it was actually not the last time I saw him, but one of the last times I saw him, he came and he said, hey, I got to ask you a question. 
He said, I've done a little research on you, you know, Adventist people, and uh, you, you seem, you know, like you're gospel believers, but you've got some weird stuff. And uh, can I ask you, you know, you, I just love the way you teach. I love the way you preach. I love the connection you have with our students and the rapport, and they listen to you. Um, can I ask you a question? Can I just be really open and honest with you? And I said, yeah, yeah, Ben, knock yourself out. What is it? He said, I got to ask you about this when you die thing, you don't go to heaven. He said, I, I, you guys believe that when you die, you don't go to heaven? What? Now, this is an opportunity for me to set him straight biblically or to show him the truth biblically, or it's an opportunity to build a bridge, right? Now, I'm dealing with somebody here who's a follower of Jesus, who loves God, somebody that I view as an ally, somebody who's in a secular context, secular country, trying to make an impact on young people for the gospel. So this is not an opportunity to build a wall between somebody that I re regard as a colleague in Christ. So I'm going to build a what? What do you think I'm going to build? I'm going to build a bridge. And it's not difficult to do. I say this to Ben. I said, Ben, I'm so glad that you felt comfortable enough with our relationship just to ask me straight out what it is that I believe. And let me just put your mind at ease here. What you and I believe is experientially identical. And Ben's like, what? Well, explain that to me. I said, well, let me just give you an illustration. If something were to happen to me on the way home, let's say I got involved in a car accident and I died uh, today as I'm traveling home. What do you believe Scripture teaches? What do you believe would be the next thing that I would know? What would be my next conscious thought? And he said, Jesus in glory. You'd, you'd see Jesus in glory. I said, that's what I believe. I believe that if something were to happen to me and I were to die on the way home today, that the next conscious thought that I would have would be Jesus in glory. I said, the only difference is I believe that there's a, a period there that the Bible calls a state of a sleep between when I have that experience. You think it happens immediately. I think it happens at the resurrection. But experientially, what you and I believe is the same. And you know what he says? He says, man, that makes a lot of sense. That's a bridge. There was ample opportunity there for me to build a wall, to put up a wall, because we're coming, even though we're both followers of Jesus, we're coming from different denominational affiliations, different denominational loyalties. And I could have easily said, well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 it says, and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 it says, and in John chapter 11 it says, I could have given a, a, a bulleted Bible study. I could have done it, and I've done it many times before. But rather than peppering him with, with what I regard as the biblical truth, and I do regard it, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to continue to build bridges with somebody that I regard as also a follower of Jesus. So here's the first little tool for your toolbox. When you're dealing with those that love Jesus and who take Scripture seriously as God's Word, maximize similarity with them. Maximize similarity. Don't build walls when bridges will do. And here's why. In religious conversations, whether it's with a Muslim, which I'll talk about in a second, or a Baptist, or a Catholic, or an atheist, the walls are already there. The religious walls are already there. So you don't have to build a wall because they already exist, right? If you build more walls, all you're doing is adding to the battery of walls that already exist between your worldview and theirs. So rather than building walls that'll take care of themselves, seek to build bridges. How do you build a gospel bridge? How do you make that transition that Jesus and Paul so seamlessly made and that Ellen White said in regards to our hospitals we should make that we would give a clear, simple answer that doesn't unnecessarily arouse prejudice? How do we invite fishermen to be fishers of men? And how do we speak to women who need water about the water of eternal life? And how do we speak to young men who are financially motivated about the best possible investment? That's what we see happening here. Right? I'm speaking to somebody, well, I could talk about the bridges, I could talk about the differences, I could talk about why I think his view is wrong and my view is correct. There, there, there's a time and a place for that. That's not the time and the place. Right there, the thing to say is, Ben, what you and I believe is experientially identical. And then I did clarify what the nature of the difference was, and you know what happened? He leaves saying, oh, that makes sense. And do you think I still get invitations back? Of course I do, because the relationship is still there. So many times in our witnessing, it's not witnessing at all. It's actually just closing doors on people, closing doors on relationships, and, and making sure that no one ever asks us again about our faith or about what we believe. At the end of the day, you always want to leave people positive, feeling positive about the interaction that they've had with you if it has been of a religious nature. Let's talk about my experience with Jehovah's Witnesses. So you might not know this, but my own personal conversion to Christ actually begins in part with Jehovah's Witnesses knocking on my door. 
So when I meet Jehovah's Witnesses, such as happened not too long ago, right in this very community, when I was out with Mel Burrett, we were walking around the streets interviewing people for our annual Christmas program last year. And uh, we were interviewing people, you know, what does Christmas mean to you, et cetera, et cetera. And we came up to a group of Jehovah's Witnesses that were there handing out tracts as they do. I already knew the answer in advance, but it would have been socially awkward to have asked all the people around and then just to have walked by them. And so I'm going to extend the invitation, say, hey, guys, you're out here handing out tracts. Could, could we interview you for our local church program on what does Christmas mean to you? And uh, they say, absolutely not. Of course, that's not going to happen. You know that Christmas is a pagan. And they start right into it. They are just, they're just right into, you know, Christmas this and Christmas that. It probably didn't help that I was wearing a Santa Claus hat to try and entice people <laughs> into the interview. But before they could get going too fast, this is one of the first things that I said to them, and I often say to my friends that are Jehovah's Witnesses or people that I meet that are Jehovah's Witnesses. I say, I'm, I just want to say I'm personally so thankful for the work of Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, let me tell you right now. When you say that to somebody who's a Jehovah's Witness, they do not know what to do with it because no one ever says that to them. <laughs> never, never, never. Because if you have friends or associates that are Jehovah's Witnesses, you'll be aware that there's this very strong us and them. Hey, no, you know, the world is, you know, out to get, and, and no, and against, and antagonism, and hostile. And that's happened right there. In that conversation, they were right into it. They were going to give me the truth about Christmas and the truth about pagan origins and the truth about, they were into it. And so I quickly interrupted and said, man, I just want to let you guys know I'm so thankful personally for the work of Jehovah's Witnesses. And they're like, you know, the jaw falls to the ground. They've got to pick it up. How? How can you be thankful for the work of Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, I tell them, I became interested in Jesus through the visit of two young men, Jehovah's Witnesses, to my home when I was 22 years old. And I was a purple-haired punk rocker, and I was kind of interested in religion, but not really interested. And lo and behold, one day, uh, two Jehovah's Witnesses knocked on my door, and that began a two-hour-long conversation that happened at my doorstep. At my doorstep. And they answered many questions that I had, and then I say this. Those young men were helpful, respectful, kind, and passionate. And I'm just so thankful that those two young men came to my door because they got a purple-haired, largely atheistic punk rocker thinking about Jesus. So, so thank you guys so much for the work you're doing. Carry on. We understand if you don't want to do our interview, have a great day. They, they don't know what to do. They've just been roundly affirmed, and I've just spoke with such positivity to them. And as I'm sort of walking away, hey, thank you. So by the way, I'm the pastor of the local Seventh-day Adventist church just up the road. And they're just like, what do you do with that? <laughs> right? What do you do with that? Because even when people come to me with, with combativeness or with hostili hostility and they want to get into a theological machine gun fight, no, I'm going to cut it off and I'm going to speak insofar as it's possible with affirmation and with approval. So here's your second tool in your toolbox. Not only maximize similarity, but affirm and appreciate others so that you preemptively disarm potential hostility or combativeness. Affirm and appreciate. And that segues really nicely into the third story that I want to tell you about Suparna, who is a Hindu clinical psychologist. So many of you will remember from several years ago, we had an Arise student named Akil. And Akil came here, and he's uh, uh, Indian origin, and uh, he, I, in the course of our conversation, he loves guitar, I love guitar. He was Bible working at the Vine for a while, attending here quite a bit too. And uh, he, I told him that I love Indian food. And he said, oh, man, you love Indian food. I said, yeah, it's my favorite food. He said, my mom is coming up to visit in a few weeks' time. C could, could, she'll make us all Indian food. Could you come and hang out with my mom? I'd love to have you and your wife and, and Robbie Morgan over. And we could just sit down and chat. And I'd love for you to meet my mom. Because she kind of thinks, you know, because he was raised Hindu. Akil was raised Hindu. He's now become a follower of Jesus. And mom's not quite sure where to put that. Right? She sees some really positive changes in her son's life that she's excited about, but she's a little nervous, as you would be if you raised your child in one religious tradition and then they've suddenly skipped to another. So would you sit down and eat with my... Yeah, I'd love to. So we had a, a meal not too far from our house there with uh, my wife and, and Robbie and um, Akil and his mom and our kids were there and, and we're sitting down. And at first it's just about food and all of that kind of thing. And, and then we, we sort of sit down in the living room and the conversation turns and, and you know, becomes more spiritual. Because in many ways, I suppose, Saparna viewed me as somebody that was responsible for, largely responsible for the decision that her son had made, right? Not entirely because he came here as a believer, but in helping to solidify his conversion to Christianity. And, and so she had some questions for me. Right? Now, she's coming from a totally different perspective. She's also a lecturer at, you know, Sydney University, and uni I don't know if it's Western Sydney or both of those that Akil told me just this morning. She's a lecturer. She's a big shot. Right? She, she's no dummy. And so, in this conversation, I begin, I preempt the religious conversation by saying, Suparna, 
um, I would love to better understand what Hinduism is for you and what it means to you. Can, can you help me to better understand what you believe? So I ask her this question, and then she proceeds over the course of the next half an hour to tell me about her own personal journey in Hinduism, the things that she's really appreciated, and some things that she has found personally frustrating. So now I'm not playing the role of talking. I'm not playing the role of informer. I'm playing the role of what am I doing? I'm listening. Can you help me to better understand what it is that you believe? In the course of that conversation, I pulled out another tool that I'm going to give to you. This is a hugely helpful tool. In the course of that conversation, when it became situationally appropriate, I say, Saparna, can I ask you a question as a, as a follower of the Hindu faith? What do you see as the primary problem facing the world, and what is the solution from a Hindu perspective to that primary problem? Oh, she says, and she's right in to the Hindu question, what is the world's major problem, and what's the answer to that, right? Now, another tool for your toolbox. Use the primary problem, primary solution tool to better understand an unfamiliar worldview. It works with every worldview. If you're talking to an atheist, you can say, from an atheistic perspective, what do you view as the primary problem facing humanity today, and what do you see as the solution? If you're talking to a Muslim, you can say, what do you see as the primary problem and the primary solution? If you're talking to a Catholic, if you're talking to a, uh, somebody of the Baha'i faith, anything works. Right? And, and what happens is, is now you get this really open, honest, give-and-take conversation with somebody where you're doing a lot of learning and a lot of listening. Now, in the course of that conversation, Suparna begins to reveal some things that she has personally found a little frustrating with the Hindu faith and some really positive changes that she's seen in her son Akhil's life. And so when it was conversationally appropriate, this is about an hour and a half into the discussion, I say, Suparna, can you tell me what do you know about Jesus and about Christianity? Rather than launching in, do everything I've got to tell her, right? I could spend hours, you know, I could talk her ears right off, right, as I'm doing to you right now. It's an, uh, this is a time to listen. This is a time to say, help me to understand your own experience with Christianity. What do you know about it? What do you know about Jesus? And so she responds. At the end of that conversation, it, we had had such a rapport and such a connection. She shed tears in that conversation. It was a beautiful, it wasn't just about religion. It was about all the things that life is about. Religion and children and marriage and life and international moves and all of that. It was about all of that. And, and in the course of the conversation, it became very obvious to me that it's going to be situationally appropriate for me as we left to say, Saparna, before we go, can I pray with you? What do you think she said? Yes. She said, yes, of course. You can pray with me. Now, was she baptized at the end? No, but I'll tell you this. This is how that conversation ended. It ended like this. She said, listen, David, if you and your wife, Violetta, ever, if I ever get word that you come to Sydney and I don't hear about it and you're not staying at my house and you're not eating my food, I will be personally offended. <laughs> okay? So did I build a bridge there or a wall? A yeah, a, a, a bridge so much so that she's like, please come to my house, sleep in my beds, eat my food. That's, that's success. That's gospel success. Because here, a follower of Jesus has had a positive interaction with somebody of another faith tradition, of, an, of a different worldview, and they have been favorably, positively impressed. Not with David only. That's not what it's about. But they have been favorably impressed with the gospel. With the gospel. Can I pray with you? And the answer was yes. Be comfortable in your conversations with others not knowing everything right? And be willing to admit your ignorance. Several times in the course of my conversation with Saparna, I had to say, I, you'll have to forgive me. I'm not super familiar with what Hindus believe about. Or I've read parts of the Bhagavad Gita, but I didn't understand it. Could you help me to... I'm having those kinds of conversations rather than just pigeonholing people saying, oh, they're Jehovah's Witnesses. They're all like this. Oh, they're Muslims. They're all like this. Several years ago, I had an interaction with a fellow named Kifa Abdul Muhammad, who was a devout Muslim. I saw him sitting what was clearly a religious book, a holy book. It was actually quite a mistake. I walked up to him. I thought he was reading a Bible. He was, in fact, reading a Quran. I walked up to him. I said, hey, brother, how you doing? Are you reading a Bible? And he's like, no, man, I'm reading the Quran. And I'm like, Whoa, okay, here we go. Let's see where this goes. <laughs> and um, we ended up having a really good conversation. In fact, we ended up having a relationship that lasted until I moved away from the area. We had a great relationship that lasted many months, including many conversations. But that first conversation, that initial conversation, went something like this. I had learned enough about Muslims to know that when he says, are you a Christian, that if I say yes, what I'm actually saying is, I'm a Roman Catholic who supports U.S. foreign policy. That's what I'm saying. So he says, are you a Christian? I say, I'm an Adventist. He says, what do you think he says? What's that? 
Well, this is an opportunity for me to say the thing that I learned to say. I say, well, I'm somebody who believes that Messiah is returning. I pray three times a day. I give 10% of my income, return not less than 10% of my income to charitable sources. That's important because Muslims return 2.5%. Um, I don't defile my bodies with with drugs or nicotine or alcohol. I do not defile my body with unclean foods such as pork. Um, and I look forward to the judgment. <laughs> and do, do you know what Kifa says? Kifa said something to me that I have heard many times. Uh, let me just come back to this. Many times I have heard, you're a better Muslim than I am from a Muslim. And that's exactly what Kifa said to me. He said, man, you're a better Muslim than I am. You're a better Muslim than I am. Because I've learned... And we could get Sam up here to give us a whole talk about this. Sam Benello, who spent seven years in Muslim ministry, how to build bridges. How to build bridges. One of my favorite things in building bridges with my Islamic friends, and by the way, this works. Trust me on this. Step out of your comfort zone, and the next time you're just in a situation where it's situationally appropriate, this happened to me recently at um, Corumban Wildlife Sanctuary. Uh, the Violetta's family was out petting kangaroos and, you know, doing that thing, and there was a little shaded spot there, and there was an a Islamic woman and her, you know, s slightly older children sitting, you know, in the shade, and I came down and sat right next to them, and this is one of my go-to lines if I have the opportunity to engage with a Muslim. I say, hey, I notice that you're a Muslim here. It appears that you're a Muslim. I just want to say to you, you know, as somebody that, uh, you know, lives here, I don't believe everything I hear in the media about Muslims. Oh! Oh, you want to know what? You want it. The lights come on. They're like, oh, thank you so much for saying that. We started right into a conversation. Right into a conversation. I mean, because you have a people who feel to some significant degree that the rest of the world is looking upon them with huge suspicion, especially when you're in a country like, like Australia or America where they're a minority, just going out of your comfort zone to say, hey, I just want you to know, I'm, I don't, it's amazing. Conversation instantly. You don't believe me? Try it. Try it. Try it. It actually works really, really well. Understand the elasticity and fluidity of language. Here's another tool. Are you saying what you think you're saying? Right? If I say to them, yes, I'm a Christian, I think I'm saying I'm a follower of Jesus who takes Scripture seriously. That's not what I'm saying. To a Muslim, what I'm saying is I'm a Roman Catholic because they don't understand the Protestant Catholic distinction. They don't understand that distinction. Some of them, of course, do. But if you say you're a Christian, the, you're saying the Pope is your guy and you support American foreign policy. That's what you're saying. Now, you know that's not what you're saying when you say you're a Christian. So you have to understand the fluidity and the elasticity of language. Joel, the genuine atheist, came to a series of meetings that I conducted in this church several years ago. And uh, in that conversation with Joel, it went like many conversations that I've had with atheists. I had the opportunity, in fact, right over here in, in Kingscliff, as we were sitting down over, uh, uh, I had an orange juice, he had a coffee. I got to say this to him. Joel, I am resonant with many of the intellectual motivations for atheism. I understand why people are atheists. I just want to let you know right out of the gate, I am deeply resonant with many of the intellectual motivations for atheism. And he's like, whoa, what? A pastor is saying that to me. My next line is, I actually watched a debate several years ago between a Christian and an atheist, and I was pulling for the atheist. It's a true story. Because I watched this debate between Dinesh D'Souza and Christopher, the late Christopher Hitchens. And Dinesh, Christopher Hitchens basically got up front in this debate at King's College and he raised three objections to the Christian faith. Number one, eternal burning hell. Number two, evolution working through all of these, you know, many generations of death to get to this Edenic couple, you know, Adam and Eve. And number three, the record of the church in the dark ages. Okay, well, guess what my answer is at all of those? I agree. I, I wish I could have debated Christopher Hitchens, not because I was an intellectual match for him. He would have smashed me. He's an intellectual giant. He's, sub, he's since passed. But I would have loved to have been in that debate because I, I could have just stood up and said, I just want to affirm with all of the enthusiasm I can muster everything that, that Christopher Hitchens has said and sit down. My speech would have been 30. And what would they have done? Because I don't believe in eternal conscious torment, and I cannot try and defend the record of the, uh, the Roman church during the medieval period, and I don't believe in evolution as God's means of creation. So his objections, and now this is a key, here's another tool in your toolbox. With some groups, emphasizing your peculiarity will actually be a strength, not a hang-up. Right? Some people, are, they shy away, oh, I'm an Adventist, and we eat a little strange, and we talk a little strange, and we believe some kind of strange things. Let me tell you, with certain groups, like if you meet Jewish people, I've had some amazing interactions with Jewish people. Those idiosyncratic 
uniquenesses that are, that, are, that are sort of Seventh-day Adventist are actually strengths when it comes to interacting with people that are on the fringes themselves or on the periphery themselves, right? Okay, one more here and then I'll let you go. Pa Kate, a Pentecostal minister. Kate has come to this very church on a number of occasions. The first time I met Kate, I was speaking in her living room and uh, I had been invited to go to Kaikoura, New Zealand to take an evangelistic meeting there. When we arrived, I said to the pastor, Paul Gredig, who had invited me to come, where's the church? And he says, oh, no, there's no church in this town. You'll be speaking in the home of the local Pentecostal minister. I said, oh, okay, great, let's go. So I went into Kate's house there, it, literally in her living room. There's 35 other people assembled, and I gave a message on why I believe the Bible is God's word and why I don't believe in eternal conscious torment in the fires of hell. Okay, right, I, I didn't know, just right there, like in the living room. And uh, Kate ends up approaching me afterwards and says, man, I just love what you're talking about, and I, I love your, your presentation and your message. We're going to be in America a little later this year. I would love to connect with you. This is when I was still living in America. So, man, I'd love that. What are the dates? She gives me the dates. I give her my dates. And she ends up coming to meet with where we were. She and her husband, Adrian, come and meet with us in beautiful Wyoming. And uh, we end up camping together for two weeks. Well, on the second or third night of that camping trip, Kate comes up to me. I don't barely know her, but I'm on a camping trip with her. She comes up and says, hey, can I talk to you about some things? Could we have dinner at my little you know, campsite tonight? I'd like to share some things with you. I said, yeah, I'd love to. So she uh, puts together this lovely little dinner, and uh, we go over there. It's like 8 o'clock at night under the beautiful Wyoming sky. I mean, it's just big sky country. It's just amazing. And she gives me an hour-long Bible study on the gift of tongues. She says, man, I love what I'm hearing from you. I love what I'm hearing from your... Sp I've watched you on 3ABN. I love what I'm hearing, but you guys don't have all the truth. You're missing the truth about the baptism of the Spirit. So she gives me this hour-long Bible study on the baptism of the Spirit, hour-long Bible study on the gift of tongues, and then, and I shut up. I know that's hard for some of you to imagine, but it does happen. <laughs> I just listen, 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 and when the whole thing is done, when the whole thing is done, notice what I say to her. I said, Kate, first of all, thank you for this excellent Bible study. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Here's three points we absolutely agree on, right? Number one, the gifts of the Spirit are absolutely for the ongoing ministry of the church. Number two, number three, I identify for her of all the things you just said, yes, yes, and yes. Notice I start with points of affirmation and agreement, okay? Then after I've spent 20 or 30 minutes talking about points of agreement, or not that long, probably five to 10 minutes, I say to her, now, here's where we might not see exactly eye to eye. Notice how I've modulated the difference. I didn't say, here's where you're wrong. <laughs> here's where we might, there's a, there's a modifier, might not see exactly, there's a modifier, eye to eye, there's a modifier, right? And I said, with your permission, I could take a little time to share with you why I believe what I believe. And she said, yeah, by all means, go ahead. So I then gave her a shorter, probably about a 30-minute Bible study on passages of Scripture that I find really persuasive, especially around, in and around 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. And as the Bible study is coming to a close, I'm telling you the truth, Violetta was there. As the Bible, this short little Bible study that I've given in this context of mutuality, we've been sitting down now for two hours, I've been in her home, I've eaten her food, there's a relationship there. She puts her hand her head in her hands, and she starts weeping, and I'll never forget she says these words. Why has no one shared this with me until now? She's crying. The next day, we have prayer together, we close. The next day she comes to me and she says, David, I was up early this morning wrestling with my Jesus, wrestling with my Lord, and I am so thrilled with the newfound freedom that I have now in the teachings that you shared with me last night under that beautiful sky. Well, it was just a few months later that Kate and her husband Adrian came to the Arise program. And you know what? This is a case where they went X, they went, they went nine to ten. They were already followers of Jesus. She's already passionately involved in ministry. And she said, you know what? We're going to make a transition. We feel really good and really comfortable with your local. We want to transition to the Seventh-day Adventist church. And you know what? I said, we'll take you. We will take you. And I tell you, I was so proud of Kate. She was so responsible. She literally, as a minister in a small community in rural coastal New Zealand, she called up all of those people, many, uh, probably a dozen or two dozen people that she herself had personally taught how to speak in tongues in a way that she now regarded as not what scripture was teaching. She called them up and said, I want to have a conversation with you, a sit down and show you from the Bible what I now believe. Can you believe the responsibility of this woman of God? Clearly she is a follower of Jesus and she's a woman of God and she went where scripture directed her. 
So friends, when it comes to these interactions that you have, whether it's with somebody like Ben or Kate who are already believers, or if it's somebody who's an atheist like Joel or a Muslim or Suparna the Hindu, you listen, 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 and then when you have the, the currency, the conversational currency to speak, only then do you speak, right? And many of you see me in a speaking context and see so you think, oh, he could never do that. Trust me, I do it very well by the grace of God. Don't in any way diminish or minimize the religious experience or genuineness of the other person. That's a tool. They should not come away feeling that you've minimized their walk. If they're a Roman Catholic or if they're a Baptist or if they're a Muslim, if they feel that you have minimized their own, you're dealing with a human being. You're dealing with a human being who's on a journey, a life journey, just like you. They put their pants on one leg at a time, just like you. They, they cried at the birth of their first child, just like you. They were devastated when their parents died, just like you. You're dealing with a human being, an actual human being. Yeah, their faith commitments aren't exactly as yours, but if you can just remind yourself, I'm dealing with a human being who is made in the image of God and who is himself a son or herself a daughter of God, it will help you to relate to them in such a way that you don't feel this need, this compulsion, this theological compulsion to minimize the nature of their own religious experience. So this is what it looks like, whether we're talking about Ben, Kepha, Joel, or others. Jesus and Paul met people where they were, not where they should be. And that's what we often do as followers of Jesus. Am I right or am I wrong? We meet them where they should be. I can't for the life of me understand why we think that non-Christian people who don't accept the Bible and who are not followers of Jesus should live like Christians. They're not Christians. It, 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 they're not Christians. It's unrealistic to hold somebody to a Christian standard that themselves is not a follower of Jesus and doesn't take Scripture seriously. Right? This is why the Apostle Paul actually says in 1 Corinthians, it's around chapter 6, he goes so far as to say, but concerning those in the world, I do not judge. Because how can you? Right? So when you engage with people, you can, just, you can just shake off any of that sort of residual compulsion that you feel, that need that you feel to set people straight, meet them where they are, not where you are. And maybe not where you think they should be. Paul and Jesus spoke the language and entered into the world of those that they were ministering to. They entered into that world, and there's no greater condescension or entering into that world than Jesus, who became a man. Build bridges, not walls, because the walls will take care of themselves. Have you learned anything here this morning? Is this helpful? Last time we were together, we talked about how to keep Jesus at the center of our theology. Today we're talking about how do we keep Jesus and how do we keep Jesus' method at the center of our evangelistic, conversational outreach to those that are around us. And it boils down to this one simple idea. The walls are already there, so you don't need to build more of them. Work on building bridges. It takes no skill to build a wall between you and another person religiously. It takes skill. It takes intelligence. It takes the Holy Spirit. It takes savvy to build bridges where they don't easily exist. And I've given you today just a few tools so that you can go forward feeling more comfortable that you don't have to get someone all the way to 10 in order to have experienced gospel success. A 2 to a 3, a 3 to a 4, a 4 to a 5, any of those, or even a 4.5 to a 4.6 is gospel success. Give people an opportunity to have a positive interaction with somebody who is a follower of Jesus. And that in and of itself is gospel success. Can you say amen?